And I would encourage you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 8. Revelation chapter 8, beginning with verse 1. When the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke from the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth, and there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. This is the word of the Lord. Our gracious Father, as we turn to your word now, we ask that you would speak to us and give us an understanding of the message you have for us today. Amen. Silence. We get nervous with silence, especially in a crowd. Let's try it. Imagine 30 minutes of silence. That's a long time. We can't do it on the radio because by the time you get past about 15 seconds, they've changed the station. It's hard enough to have complete silence of a room of 100 people. But imagine the picture in heaven. A great multitude that no one could number. Thousands upon thousands of people. They have watched, they've listened, they've worshipped as the six seals have been broken in Revelation 6 and 7. They have watched as the four horsemen of the apocalypse have been revealed. They've observed the persecution of the believers, the natural disasters that happen in Revelation chapter 7. And they cry out, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And then, the seventh seal is broken. Revelation 8.1. And upon the breaking of that seal, the whole multitude grows quiet. For a half hour, no whispers, no coughs, they are in heaven, you know. There is no need for a cough in heaven. There is just the stillness of anticipation when seven angels appear before God with seven trumpets and the multitude awaits the blowing of the trumpets. Six are going to sound in these two chapters we're going to cover today. But before that, we see another angel. An angel who presents us a powerful lesson on prayer. Look again at verse 3. Another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. Before the trumpets are going to sound, before all the dread of these two chapters breaks out, we stop to consider the prayers of the saints. And what we find is that our prayers are preserved. Our prayers, your prayers, are preserved. We celebrated already this morning answered prayer in our congregation. A couple of young men who have gotten a, all clear about cancer 
and how much we have prayed for Jeremy and Timothy. But sometimes we wonder, are our prayers answered? Are they heard? Does God listen to us? Because not always do we see a a good test result after six months of treatment. We've all prayed. We've memorized the Lord's Prayer. We've made up our own prayers. We've cried out to God, sometimes seeing immediate answers, sometimes waiting six months, sometimes a year and a half, sometimes a lifetime. Sometimes failing to see any response at all. What happens to our prayers? And then comes along Revelation 8.3, which gives us this beautiful, glorious hint that our prayers are preserved in heaven. They are held there and presented before the throne at the end of time. It is an incredible word of assurance to the believer that our prayers are heard and preserved like the old love letters from our youth. Our prayers are preserved in glory. One of the distinctive features of our prayer life is the certainty of being heard. We are listened to God has dignified us by listening to our prayers. That is why missionaries send us prayer letters in the hope that we'll actually bend our knees before the throne and pray for them. They don't come to us and say, pray that we have travel mercies because they can't think of anything else to say. But they say so because they know that God responds. He has encouraged us to boldly approach his throne and he preserves our prayers for immediate effect and for long-term effect. God does not compare your prayers to spam email. You get that, don't you? I know some of you aren't on email, but if you are on email, there's a whole folder just of people that send you junk. Your mail server filters them out, most of them. You know, it's the advertisements. You know, buy something else from us. And some of them come from Russia. Not that they've been known to mess with email, but some of them come with, to, from Russia. And we just don't open those emails, do we? Here's the thing. God doesn't put your prayers in the spam filter. He actually listens to us. If our prayers were emails, he would immediately open them and read them and respond. He wouldn't just hit the delete button. He listens. He responds, and he saves our prayers to be brought back up before the sounding of the trumpets at the end of time. I find that fascinating. I find it challenging. Is it all that important that I pray that the light stay green so I can get there 30 seconds earlier? It it elevates our prayers to things far more significant because we recognize that prayer brings about dramatic change in us when we think of our prayers doing double duty. It changes both now and in the future. When we read Revelation chapter 8 with all its horror, we acquire hope because we see there our prayers there at the altar, going up before God again, doing double duty. Effective when we offer them and effective at the end of time. It is a challenge concerning the content of our prayers. Get the imagery in your mind. 
The angels are there. The seven angels getting ready to get to blow those seven trumpets. And one takes the prayers of the saints and offers them with incense on the altar before the throne. Your prayers. Our corporate prayers. Symbols of our faithfulness, our trust, and our hopes. The prayers ascend as a pleasing aroma to God once again. Makes you wonder if our prayers are too little. Makes you wonder if we're not bold enough. So in Revelation, we remember that our prayers are preserved. Fill them with faith and hope, with things of eternal significance. It's the first lesson. But then also we see that our prayers are powerful. It is easy to miss this lesson and skip forward to the sounding of the trumpets. But the, the sounding of the trumpets takes place after the prayers of the saints have been presented before God and only after our prayers are presented before God. Prayer gives us access to the throne of heaven where all the action takes place. God is there basking in our prayers. And not just ours, but the prayers of all the saints over all the centuries combined together with great power. The text says that the angel took the incense filled with fire and threw it onto the earth where there are peals of thunder, rumblings, flashings of lightning, and an earthquake. Those are our prayers. Announcing the, the, the sounding of the seven trumpets. Our prayers gathered together, thrown down on earth. I, I submit that it's easy for us to feel insignificant. The small people of the world. I submit that I come into the presence of someone like Dick and Laura Mae Gardner, and I feel insignificant. What have I done for the kingdom? Just pastored one church for 22 years, and they travel all over the world, impacting missionaries all over the world, and they translated the Bible into some language that nobody speaks. <laughs> it's easy to feel insignificant. And, and, and what about the layperson who gets up and goes to work every Monday morning and doesn't prepare a sermon and maybe three times in their life you go on a missionary trip and you pray. That's such a worldly and ungodly perspective as though prayer is an insignificant part of the equation. Outside the realms of prayer, we, we may feel insignificant, or, or maybe within our company, if you own your own company, you're, you're the boss, you know, you're pretty significant. Mostly there's little that we do that will dramatically impact the world except for prayer. On this earth, we are often misled by issues of size and influence or importance or seats of power. And then the Bible reminds us of the power of prayer. The demons that call us insignificant are swept away. Because in that precious moment, in that sweet hour of prayer, we are reminded that they are preserved and they are powerful and some of the most significant people in the church of Jesus Christ have never preached a sermon. They have never traveled to a foreign land, foreign land. All they have done is what they needed to do and what the church needed, and that is they have dedicated themselves to prayer. Our prayers which are powerful and preserved. When we pray, we consciously and deliberately enter the throne room of heaven and we expect things to happen, and they do happen. And God responds to our prayers in the short term, and he preserves them in the long term. And when we pray, we, are, we are, become aware that, that we are talking to the king of the universe who has the opportunity to impact the things that happen both here and across the globe. So we concentrate and we focus, and we lift our hearts to God. And the inconsistencies and contradictions of life fade away in light of the power of prayer. K. 
here in the silence of heaven we're given this beautiful lesson on prayer. No longer disoriented and dizzy under the impact of accidents and disappointments, we instead remember the marvel of prayer. There, at the end of time, our prayers still doing double duty. Before the sounding of the trumpets, our focus is turned to the prayers of the saints. And just when it seems as though everything is falling apart, we discover through this vision that our prayers are there in the future, doing double duty. That's a pretty cool reason to pray. Preserved and powerful, they bring our focus upon God. The angel takes our prayers, and in response, God gives approval to the sounding of the trumpets. In that half hour of silence, when the prayers of the saints are going before the throne, we wait for God to give approval of the trumpet sounds. And through prayer, we, in this time, participate in God's actions, both today and at the end of time. In part because of our prayers, the trumpets are blown and judgment falls upon the earth. Our prayers are powerful, each trumpet bringing forth a different judgment. This is Revelation 8 and 9 summarized. The first trumpet sounds hail and fire mixed with blood and a third of the earth is burned up. A third of the trees and all green grass, gone. The second trumpet sounds... A great mountain burning with fire is thrown into the sea, and fully one-third of all the living creatures in the sea are destroyed, along with one-third of the ships. The third trumpet sounds, and a great star falls from heaven called Wormwood, and one-third of the waters of the earth become Wormwood. And the scripture just says, many people die. The fourth trumpet sounds, the sun and the moon and the stars lose one-third of their light. And an eagle circles overhead. I, I'm tempted to, to go on a little rabbit trail about what the number one-third means. Because it's got to mean something, right? Maybe it means one-third of the people, the plants, the creatures. We, 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 are, we are not going down the road of numerology. There's an eagle circling overhead. And in my mind's eye, I see the whole multitude, thousands upon thousands of people looking up, and they see this incredible animal, majestic creature circling, and they hear these ominous words, Woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth. At the blast of the other trumpets, that the three angels are about to blow. And I'm thinking, how much worse can things possibly get? A third of the sea creatures are dead. A third of people are dead. Though the earth has received devastation like we haven't seen before. It turns out things can get a lot worse. Listen to the way the message renders Revelation chapter 9. The fifth angel trumpeted. I saw a star plummet from heaven to earth. The star was handed a key to the well of the abyss. He unlocked the well of the abyss. Smoke poured out of the well. Billows and billows of smoke. Sun and air in blackout from smoke pouring out of the well. Then out of the smoke crawled locusts with the venom of scorpions. They were given their orders. Don't hurt the grass. Don't hurt anything green. You're hoping you're Irish. Don't hurt a single tree. Only men and women. And then only those who lack the seal of God on their foreheads. They were ordered to torture, but not kill. Torture them for five months the pain like a scorpion sting. When this happens, people are going to prefer death to torture. They're going to look for ways to kill themselves. 
but they won't find a way because death will have gone into hiding. The locust looked like horses ready for war. They had gold crowns, human faces, women's hair, the teeth of lions, and iron breastplates. The sound of their wings was the sound of horse-drawn chariots charging into battle. Their tails were equipped with stings like scorpion tails. With those tails, they were ordered to torture the human race for five months. They had a king over them, the angel of the abyss. His name in Hebrew is Abaddon. In Greek, Apollyon, destroyer. That's just the first doom. Two more dooms to come. The sixth angel trumpeted. I heard a voice speaking to the sixth angel from the horns of the golden altar before God. Let the four angels loose. The angels confined at the great river Euphrates. The four angels were untied and let loose. Four angels, all prepared for the exact year, month, day, and even hour when they were to kill a third of the human race. The number of the army of horsemen was twice 10,000 times 10,000. I heard the, the count and saw both horses and riders in my vision, fiery breastplates on the riders, lions' heads on the horses, breathing out fire and smoke and brimstone. With these three weapons, fire and smoke and brimstone, they killed a third of the human race. The horses killed with their mouths and tails. Their serpent-like tails also had heads that wreaked havoc. The remaining men and women who weren't killed by the weapons went on their merry way. Didn't change their way of life. Didn't quit worshiping demons. Didn't quit centering their lives around lumps of gold and silver and brass, hunks of stone and wood that couldn't see or hear or move. There wasn't a sign of a change of heart. They plunged right on in their murderous, occult, promiscuous, and thieving ways. That's Revelation 9. In the end, it is the end which brings out the importance of these woes. Those who survive do not repent. The prayers of the saints that God would bring judgment and that he would bring salvation to mankind begins this rolling out of the trumpets designed for God to bring people to himself, but they do not repent. But let's fast forward a chapter and a half. To Revelation 11, verses 15 to 18. Because that's actually when the seventh trumpet sounds. Then This is what the word of God says. Then the seventh angel blew his trumpet. There were loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sit on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came. And the time for the dead to be judged and for rewarding of your saints, the prophets and saints and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of earth. It turns out our prayers are preserved and powerful and they are ultimately answered. The faithful have prayed the Lord's Prayer. You and I have prayed the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And now in Revelation chapter 11, we learn that the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. 
And it's become that in part because of our prayers. Our prayers which are answered. That God has done all that he can do to draw people unto himself, to give them the opportunity to repent, and they choose not to repent. And therefore God brings judgment upon them, which is also what we pray. And then our prayers are answered, and Christ's rule is complete. His reign is glorious. And our prayers have done double duty, preserved in heaven, presented before the, floor, the throne at the end of time, and his kingdom comes on earth. Is that not what we pray? Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Sound the trumpets. Bring about an end. Do all that you can, Lord God Almighty, so the people in my circle of influence might come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But if they continue to refuse to repent, then bring forth judgment. It is the only loving thing that a loving God can do. For he seeks to draw people. He doesn't force them to come unto himself. But he, he presents them options. The trumpet sounds. And although it seems as though all that is good is given up, all that is good is yet to come. And it happens because of our prayers. You've prayed it before, and we'll pray it again now. The Lord's Prayer. I'm going to encourage you. I don't usually do this at the end of the service, but let's stand together. We're going to close this service by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us for evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That prayer, effective today. God responding to what we just prayed together and is preserved in heaven. And at the end of time, an angel is going to hold that prayer along with the prayers of all the saints of all the ages. He's going to present it before the throne of God. Cast it down to the earth amidst flashing of lightning and thunder and earthquake. And an angel is going to sound a trumpet in an attempt to bring people unto himself and in preparation for the kingdom of this earth becoming the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you for this blessing about prayer. And as John prays at the end of Revelation, we pray, Lord Jesus, that you would come quickly. Amen. If you'd like, we actually have a prayer meeting Sunday nights, 6.15. It's about an hour we spend together in prayer. But you don't need to do it here. You can do it anywhere you want. Just don't forget to pray. It is the most important thing that you can do with your life. God bless you.